Welcome to another Military History Q&A, the only YouTube channel who is guaranteed to be fueled on ice cream and have built a fitness studio in his living room, guaranteeing that I will be single for the rest of my life. Never mind. I have ignored you ruthlessly for the past two weeks, and I'm very sorry. I was deployed uh, alongside with the National Guards, the State Guards, the member law enforcement, uh, out here on our streets because of the recent riots and demonstrations. Uh, incidentally, the largest deployment of National Guard soldiers since the Second World War, some 83,000 National Guardsmen. I have no idea how many uh, police department, uh, how many uh, State Guard units were also deployed. And that is why I, unlike every other historian with his own digital outlet, did not put out anything in the anniversary of D-Day, which was obviously something that happened this week. Um, sorry, but this is what I was doing on that very day. I did not forget you all. Uh, this is a little shout out we got to do. It's June 6th. Oh yeah, it's D-Day. It's D-Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were deployed in our own country and it's D-Day. How do yep. you guys feel about doing something for your country on the actual D-Day, actual anniversary of that? Awesome. Awesome. I'm just very happy that I'm able to help my community. That's nice. It really is. It feels something very connected to, to the Army values. And all. This episode, we are going to talk about German bunkers, the German fortified lines to the east to the west, why they were there, and who built them. I have some original footage. I have a little bit of um, uh, walkthroughs. And there's a lot of information because you have asked me a lot of questions about the uh, German bunkers. Everything from were they built by slave labor, who built them, why were they there, what did they have, so on and so forth. So this is going to be a very long, detailed, extensive episode dedicated to German fortifications and German bunkers with a lot of video inserts, the pictures I could find that were relevant and I go into some detail as to who built them and how and what sort of labor force were commanded by this and it has taken me a lot longer than I thought to research this because at every leaf something new appeared. A German bunker as built back then. You may want to put on a pot of coffee was there's going to be a lot of information coming at you that I have specifically uh, researched and cross-referenced on this one. As you know, normally when you ask me questions, I know pretty much rudimentary what happened during World War II, and where, what, and how, and I know where to look for specific information if you ask me about a piece of armor or a tank or a, or, or this or that, and I can look up its specs, and I can find out where it served and what it did and who used it, and I can come give you my speculation, my thoughts on it. Uh, if not, I can cross reference with uh, other experts and uh, people I know, historians, and just make sure. For this, there's so much information that is really hard to sort through because the World War II bunker building experience was almost unique to each person who lived it. Either if it was the workers, the forced laborers, the uh, organization toured, the German soldiers, uh, the Danes, the Dutch, the French, uh, the slave laborers, the, it, there's so much there that I try to break it down and make it somewhat intelligible. But let's start with the main German bunker of fortification, the fortified lines to the east and to the west. Coffee, on, now, go. We're talking about bunkers, fortified positions, which are strengthened positions that are making it harder for bombs of today, arrows of yesteryear to, to penetrate your, your position. You had medieval castles, you had the Vikings built up huge earth embankments with uh, poles to repel and fight from. The Germans and Americans, British, all of us, everybody, has built bunkers, strengthened positions uh, to shelter for various reasons. Uh, for instance, you look during World War One, World War Two, on the coasts of America, coasts of England, there was bunker positions, cannon positions, 
uh, fighting dugouts uh, put along the coast to guard from Japanese invasions, German invasions, um, as especially in, in England you saw as well. And uh, one thing that was pretty much even for all that the coasts and the beaches were off limits as everybody was busy planting landmines and building all the way up in today. If you go to Albania, you have millions of bunkers protecting against pretty much everybody back in the day. Um, yes, I will go at some point in time. I am a little bit curious. It is fascinating to go through history, wherever you go. World War II still sits around every corner. Here, an old German bunker shooting port still there, the iron gates. It is fascinating to wander through the European landscape and see the remnants of World War II because they're everywhere. German bunkers here. You go east, you see Russian fortifications, you see fighting positions from everywhere in the landscape that has now been incorporated in everyday life because seriously they're too big too heavy they're built too well to destroy so people build summer houses on top of them and for a lot of lucky owners around the world they have a wine cellar that will last for the next hundred years before World War II really broke out you already had fortified positions that was left behind from World War I the French took the lessons from World War I that digging in fortified positions that could be protected with relatively few B echelon troops would be an idea. So they built the Maginot Line, a huge fortified long, long position. And the Germans built their Siegfried Line across from there, which was not quite as complete and certainly not nearly as elaborate, but that was one of the German fortified lines towards the west that they started building before World War II actually broke out. It was, it evolved throughout the war, but it never became what it had been envisioned. The most interesting uh, fortified line the Germans had that you don't know about is probably the one facing east. The Ostwall towards East Poland was started in 1934 in order to guard against a Polish attack and it gradually increased and evolved, as we will see, to one of the most interesting and intricate uh, fortified lines that was built during World War II or for World War II. It almost uh, rivaled the Maginot Line. Unfortunately, when the, finally the Russians came and they needed it, they just didn't have the manpower or the weaponry to actually put it into uh, the full use they had expected. And of course, as we all know, we had the Atlantic Wall from the border of Spain all the way up to the tip of Norway, guarding all of occupied Europe against an allied invasion. That's one of the main fortified lines that we all know and have heard of. And we've all seen those bunkers. And for those of us who spent time in Europe or, or grew up there, there's bunkers everywhere and they were all built to uh, standard spec and we're going to talk a lot about those. You also build civilian air raid shelters because of course as we entered uh, the 20th century and civilian uh, bombing became a thing, civilian bunkers sprung up everywhere, air raid shelters, and you still see them in uh, most European cities. Uh, you also had to build fortified bunkers and positions to protect your underground or key uh, infrastructure, such so like producing ammunition, weapons, storage of strategic oil reserves. A lot of it was burrowed into the ground and protected there, but where that wasn't possible, you had to build large fortified, uh, like the U-boat pens in France, amazing, or the huge bunker for Hitler's train above ground. Um, you build bunkers for a lot of different reasons, but we're going to look at the fighting positions and that's what we're going to talk about today. So, I want to start talking about the East Wall or the Ostwald first because I just think it's the most interesting because it's the one most of us really don't know a whole lot about. Uh, can some of this construction started all the way back in the late 20s uh, to guard uh, Germany from attacks from the Second Polish Republic. And I am actually going out there in a few weeks here in July. So, Peter, Andrea, I'm, I'm coming to see you. And we're going to eat some good Polish food. And we will wear our shoes because I want to see everything. 
and I will bring it to you and I'm really looking forward to that. It was referred to as Festung Front Orden Warburg Borgen. It consisted of three different defensive lines. Um, this one that I have butchered the name, I'm sure. Uh, sorry. It was the fortified military defense line uh, from Nazi Germany back in the day between the Oder and Vata rivers. They used the river's waterways as a part of the defense and as a part of excuse to build and have construction in that area back in the early 30s. Uh, even before uh, Hitler took power, they were working on this defensive line, which makes it interesting. It was very much inspired by the Maginot Line. Uh, we'll see, it is, it is almost as elaborate. Parts have been referred to as Camp Earthworm, denoting that there was a lot of underground tunnels uh, that was dug in and built in this thing. Predominantly built between 1934 and 44, it was the most technologically advanced uh, bunker system uh, that the Germans built. And we're looking at over 100 defensive structures, 32 kilometers of underground railroads. Uh, this was an amazing thing. And most of the structures was partially interconnected and interlocking fields of fire. Let's get one thing straight. When I say bunkers and defensive positions for the rest of this episode, the surrounding minefields and barbed wire is just going to be mandatory. So if I say bunker, just picture in your mind without me saying so, it'll be surrounded by barbed wire, there'll be landmines and other obstacles, tank obstacles, beach obstacles if it's on the beach, surrounding it. So, disclaimer, done. They'll be everywhere. Tons of barbed wire and tons of landmines. There's some really interesting main fortifications along this line, but the system of tunnels run 32 kilometers and 40 meters deep underground. Besides that, you had access to railway stations. It has their own underground system, uh, workshops, engine rooms, infirmaries, barracks, housing. Uh, There's everything you would need was underground. Initially, before Hitler took power, the first stage uh, of, of this part of the fortification had begun, which was initially a lot of water obstacles where you could flood areas or lift bridges, thus funneling the enemy into uh, positions of, of fields of fire and landmines and whatever else you had. Uh, initially, that was pretty much what it was with 12 light bunkers. It is said that after they've been building till 35, Hitler visited and he was not entirely impressed. Now, you must look at this in the context of the then German doctrine of war, which was the complete opposite of the French and was all about movement. The German commanders had no intention of digging in in the next war like they did in World War I and sit and shell each other. They were going to move, move rapidly, get you know, all about the panzer spearheads, uh, overrun the enemy, keep exploiting breakthroughs, and not digging in. So the idea that they were actually building fortified positions to guard against attacks was a little bit at odds with the uh, pre predominant doctrine of the time. But still, they of course built to hold enemies back uh, on the on the west and in the east, you also had bunker fortifications facing like Czechoslovakia, and all of this east wall uh, was not scheduled to be finished until 1951. But of course, uh, war broke out in 1939, and the Germans advanced way past this fortified line, way into the east. So all work uh, ceased on uh, on this fortification after about 1938 uh, until 1944 when the war in the East was moving closer to Germany and they tried to rapidly expand and refortify this position. When the Russians finally got to it in 1945 around January in their main offensive, Germany was very short of resources, weapons, soldiers, so the line was held and filled by uh, reservists, Volkssturm, uh, Hitler Youth, not the top-notch troops that it had been envisioned, and the weaponry was many times missing. Uh, the cannons and machine guns they were told they would find in the bunkers were just missing. There wasn't one there. They still managed to hold the Russians at bay for three days. 
given how little they actually had at that time, that was rather impressive. Underground factories had moved into this uh, area, and all of this was, of course, taken by the Russians after the war ended. But all the bunkers are still there to see today. It's an amazing museum. Most pens of egg of the central section were large rectangular shaped type B, about one and a half meters uh, wall thickness, concrete bunkers. They're all designed to be self-sufficient, closed combat quarters. The Pennsylvania, the house, the, the crew, the quarters, the sanitation, amenities, machine rooms, ammunition, storage, all of this was all self-contained. If it was there, which in 1945, some of it had uh, been taken away to more active fronts and it was missing, it didn't show up before the Russians did. You also get the machine gun steel turrets, armored observation cupolas, five centimeter mortar positions. You even had flamethrowers set up in this position. So it was designed to defend just like the Maginot Line. Uh, had it been fully staffed, equipped and fitted up, it would have been interesting to see how long it would have taken for the Russians to break through. But as we know, all defensive positions can be broken. Another part was the Pomeranian Wall. It was constructed in two phases from 1930 to 35 as a light defensive position in case of attack from the, like I said, the Second Polish Republic. And then there was a line of fortify fortification stretching from Landsberg to Amdervade, Kratzow, Filipulski, to Baldenburg. I am sorry to my friends in Poland. I Teach me your language and I will not butcher it online. There's some really impressive stomp points on this one, the uh, Deutsche Kronen and the Hangman's Mountain. Second phase of this uh, construction really did not start until 1944, but then it uh, didn't quite make it um, in time for the Russians to show up and knock on the door. Then you had a southern part of the position near the Nies River. The Oder position was a fortified line near the river, Oder in Silesia, and East Brandenburg consisted of a about 650 reinforced concrete bunkers. They were supposed to have been 780, but they didn't get that far. The southern extension of the Oderwaden Fortress Arms again started in 1928 and continued all the way up until 1939 when, when they stopped, when there was no need for it until well, back to 1944. Hundreds of, of wooden shelters, uh, earth shelters, concrete machine gun positions, trenches, armored trenches, reinforced artillery positions. All the usual fun stuff, like I said. But this is a whole bunker complex structure that was facing the east. It's in Poland now, for the most part, since the borders moved after World War II. And there's an amazing museum. There's some great guys that I am talking to and looking forward to visit and walk through all these uh, uh, underground tunnels. But just imagine, 40 meters down, 32 kilometers of uh, tunnels. That is an amazing amount. You look at just one stretch of this, 650 bunkers. This is an enormous fortified line that most of you may not have heard of and some of you have not had a chance to visit. And I will give you a full breakdown reporting of there, including the best restaurants I find in the neighborhood. The West Wall, the secret line, was built opposite the French Maginot Line, or at least to counter it. But it was not initially nearly as elaborate. We're still looking at the start of building in the 1930s, and it stretched more than 630 kilometers, all the way from Cleve, border of the Netherlands, along the western border of the old German Empire, to the town of Ville am Rhein, on the border of Switzerland. So all the way on German's western border. It had more than 18,000 bunkers and tunnels and tank traps, a lot of dragon's teeth. Initially in the early 30s, it was only small bunkers, 50 centimeter thick, uh, wood wall embrasures, um, facing front sleeping accommodations were hammocks. Um, exposed positions, wooden roofs, small bunkers were erected here and there uh, with, a, you know, armored turrets, uh, lookout roofs. It was carried out by the Border Watch, the Grenzwatch, um, which was a fairly small militarized troop that was activated in Rhineland right after the region was remilitarized after the demilitarization. But it was not at all what it eventually became, or certainly not what it was envisioned as 
uh, was supposed to have been. In 1938, the Limes program was ordered by Hitler in order to strengthen the fortifications facing uh, France. Was the cover story for the program was that it was an uh, uh, archaeological study. It's a very long archaeological dig, 630 kilometers. Anyway, everything has a cover story. A lot of Type 10 bunkers, far more uh, strongly con uh, constructed than their earlier ones, had a meter and a half, it was about four feet, some thick ceilings, walls, about 3,400 of these were built along the entire length of the Siegfried Line. It features central rooms or shelters, and you had elevated sections with embrasures with front and sides for machine guns. More embrasures were provided for riflemen. The entire st structure was constructed uh, as to be safe against poison gas. Although everybody had signed on to not using poisonous gas, you never knew. There was also heating installed because there were some cold winters that I actually wrote about. They, they were still fairly tight. You're looking about one square meter, about 11 square feet per soldier that was allocated in the living quarters. Um, but he got a place to sleep and he had a chair. What more could you possibly ask for in the infantry? even today. Then you had the Arkansas program bunkers were pretty similar to the ones that had been designed for the Liam's program. Uh, type 107, double MG casemates, uh, concrete walls all the way up to three and a half meters thick. That's about 11 feet. So now we're getting into serious bunker territory here. The differences was that there was no embrasures at the front, only on the sides of the bunkers. Embrasures were only built at the front in special cases and were protected with heavy metal doors. The construction phase included the towns of Aachen and Saarbrücke, which were initially west of the Liams program defensive line. You also had the Western Air Defense Zone, which was lines paralleling the defensive lines, where you had anti-aircraft, uh, MG-34 and 42, and flak cannon positions and uh, flak bunkers set up to guard against Allied aircraft that would have to cross the line in order to get in over Germany. On the Siegfried Line, all the construction was done by the tour organization that had almost 500,000 laborers, private firms, at its disposal to work on, on this. And it was dangerous work. It was large, heavy 60-ton armored plates uh, to be moved. It was cold, it was wet, and uh, certainly accidents happened. Uh, a lot of the workers for the tort organization uh, were volunteers, as you see with the, with the construction of the German Autobahn, of the freeways back in the day. Uh, there was also forced laborers, and we'll talk more about that, but one thing, when we say forced laborers, there's a distinct difference between, between them and between forced laborers and slave labor, and POWs that have been put to work. Uh, a lot of the forced laborers were forced in the sense that, well, uh, German worker, you have no other job that is important to the war industry, so now you have a job and you're going to go build bunkers. In that sense, they were forced to work on something else that was more important to the war effort or the pending war effort or the defense of the country than whatever they were doing. So if you thought you were selling, uh, if you're a big strong man and you were selling newspapers on the corner, uh, no, you would be reconstructed into the labor service. Uh, m everybody who worked on the West Wall construction, they even got a medal for it, they got paid, they had meals, and yes, they were still miserable. During the construction of the Secret Line, the German industry had a hard time delivering all the steel that was needed for what was intended. Uh, although Germany had strategically built railways ever since World War I, and these were utilized very, very well for the construction and movement of construction materials throughout Germany and later throughout Europe. Uh, initially, as it is with tanks, early war tanks, they were under-armored and under-gunned. The initial bunkers that was built in the, in the mid to late 30s were initially, as it turned out as the war begun, undergunned, and some of the guns and steel plates were removed and, and moved over to the construction of the Atlantic Wall that was so much more important, at least until just around July 1944, when D-Day had apparently succeeded. The priority was put back on construction of the Siegfried Line, and a lot of Chubrucks were put up, a lot of Dragon's Teeth, and so on and so forth.
all of which at the time of the Allies getting there really did not prove much, very helpful. And as we see with the initial construction phases that had led up to 1939, after the invasion of Poland, the French army actually made a little foray into Germany. Uh, they in, advanced some, some 10, 15 kilometers, more on that in a later episode when I go there. It was not supported, it was not backed up, it was certainly not halted by the, uh, by the at that time, secret line. With the German soldiers, they were in the open with machine guns, a few mortars, a few cannons, and they saw French tanks roll up uh, towards them. They didn't want to open fire because they were afraid that then they'll probably get fired upon exponentially and not survive. So uh, the secret line initially were not really worth a whole lot. Um, certainly not what it eventually turned into or should have been. One of the things that was the French doctrine and when it came to bunkers, fortifications, the German as well as well, most countries were that your battle-hardened, tough frontline troops would be out fighting a battle, while the B echelon, the ones who were recovering from wounds, the little younger, the little older, could man these fortified positions with fewer people, less well-trained, uh, less capable, because they had a very limited duty. You sit here, you look out this embrasure with your machine gun, and you shoot anything that's not wearing our uniform. That's pretty damn simple. Uh, of course, it also gives some morale issues, and especially if you look at the Western Wall, or the Atlantic Wall, rather, if you look at the Atlantic Wall and the people who fortified and occupied it, yes, you had hundreds of thousands of German troops, which was a lot fewer than it would have taken to defend the same stretch of territory without all these positions. However, they were not the best troops, and they were augmented by uh, Russian, Ukrainian, and I have actually found a few Polish. When I say volunteers, let me break that down. If you are a Russian, uh, Ukrainian, Polish, whatever soldier, and you're sitting in a German prison of war camp, that can barely feed you and you are looking at the possibility of sitting outdoors starving to death in the next winter and the option of well volunteering for the German army comes along in the sense of self-preservation and exactly what you do so there was a lot of Eastern European volunteers that was defending uh, in, in, in Normandy in France and in these positions um, which, of course, did not give it the same fighting capability if it had been uh, manned by well-trained, motivated uh, German troops all along the line. But these were in shorter and shorter supply and needed to starve off the Russians from the east. But that was the same thing with the Maginot Line. The French put their B echelon troops throughout the Maginot Line and honestly, they did a very good job. We always thought the French were overrun in a matter of, uh, with ease. Uh, the French problems during the invasion of France in World War II was not really the Maginot Line. It was built to make the Germans attack somewhere else, which they did, so it was successful. And in, in the first day of, uh, of attack on there, four out of the six uh, invasion, the German invasion points were halted by the French defenders. So it, in theory, uh, could work, and that's pretty much what the Germans did. They sat down on the coasts, and of course, the Atlantic Wall, that we have all heard so much about and seen in the movies. The Atlantic Wall was probably the largest building construction project of the 20th century. It came about after, of course, Germany had uh, invaded France, Denmark, Norway, and was in a two-front war against the Soviet Union, but always expecting an Allied landing to liberate Europe from the West. It was initially called the West Wall, uh, but since it already had a West Wall, it was renamed to the Atlantic Wall. It was stretched all the way from the uh, borders of Spain all the way up to the far side of Norway. 
covering Denmark, Netherlands, Holland, Belgium, France, uh, Norway, where you still today see all these amazing structures. As we go through the landscape of Europe today, everywhere there are signs of a war that never really touched the American shores. We were never really bombed as it happened here in Europe. And I will say that they are amazing structures. Uh, they were built in the most far-flung places, uh, places that are imp impossible to construct in today. And uh, they really are fascinating to see. Uh, some people like to go see pyramids. I like to go see bunkers because I'm impressed with what people could imagine and do and see these interlocking and underground and disguised in many cases bunkers. No matter where you go in Europe today, you find remnants like this old German bunker fortification from the coast of Denmark all the way down the coast of France. Men and women fought and died here 75 years ago. And their memories are disappearing along with them. It all started uh, on the West Wall with somewhere around 1942 where in the occupied territories, uh, France, Belgium, Holland, all civilian construction was halted because all cement and resources were to be used in order to build uh, these bunkers and this. It was put under the auspices of uh, the Tote organization, uh, which uh, was Fritz Tote, who uh, was pretty much in charge of the German uh, logistics for the building program. He was killed in an air crash and, uh, and Speer took all, Albert Speer took over. Uh, Evan Rommel was in the final year of the war put in charge of the Atlantic Wall and his philosophy was to stop the enemy on the beach or at sea and not let them allow them a beachhead. Of course, Evan Rommel fought uh, the British and Americans in uh, in, in, um, in Egypt, in the, in the desert, and he knew what Allied air power could do. Uh, some of the slightly older generals uh, were not hearing his point of view, and there was a large debate within the German high command in France between uh, Rommel and Ronstadt to begin with on where and how to prepare uh, for this defense. But one thing was certain, they were going to build a lot of fortifications and a lot of bunkers facing the sea. So you had huge cannon emplacements all the way down to um, machine gun positions, the small two-person Tobruk bunkers that you see everywhere. On the street and roadways, you even have armored uh, single guard posts. Uh, which was rather interesting to see, both in metal and uh, some in concrete. Steel sentry cage. You had dragon's teeth all over the beaches, and your command posters, observation posts, radar positions, flag positions, uh, man uh, man positions where the the crews of the cannons would be stationed. You have interlocking running trenches. You have uh, positions all interlocking fields of fire, so they're mutually supportive, uh, lots of underground uh, connecting tunnels where possible, and some enormous uh, cannon positions and command positions. They even built a rocket production facility that was never quite completed, because towards the end of the war it was severely damaged by Allied bombing, um, and by the time that they could have recovered from that, it had been taken over uh, by Allied ground forces. Uh, but in am amazing constructions, also you had the U-boat pens. Specifically around the port cities, they were built uh, cannon positions, defensive positions, to defend against uh, an, an obvious invasion attempt on the ports. Because of course, that time, invasion and military is all about logistics. So if the Allies could run straight into a port facility and take it intact, they could have their ships come in and un unload uh, supplies and advance from there. So the ports were especially well defended, and you still today see some of these enormous bunkers that you literally cannot destroy.
I see in, in, in Denmark, a friend of mine, he owns a restaurant. He literally just built it on top of the, um, of, of the German command bunker in that area. I can't move it. Uh, people have built ice cream parlors inside bunkers. Great wine cellars. I, I always wanted one. So if you have a, a bunker for sale, uh, I'll, I'll take it. Well, I'll take two. Um, so you had these, uh, these fortifications all the way through. And of course, uh, the inhabitants of these areas uh, were moved out or relocated. Uh, I will say every, every one of the fighting powers closed off their beaches and in some cases relocated the population away from what could potentially become a fighting zone. So nothing specific uh, about the Germans to that. Uh, we did it, the British did it, everybody did it. Uh, you have to get civilians out of the way, and if that means they have to move their house because you need to put a, a cannon position or a bunker there, well, too bad. Originally, more than 15,000 bunkers had been planned, but of course, Germany was at war, two fronts, building other places. Only 6,000 were actually constructed by the deadline of May 1, 1943. Uh, of these, 510 were in Holland alone, where they were supposed to have been 2,000. One of the questions I've often been getting on this is, were that bunker constructed with slave labor? The Germans would take over uh, whatever pre-existing fortifications there already were. Uh, some of the Dutch fortifications were taken over and expanded by the Germans. And what is interesting about how this all came about. Remembering the German doctrine was that of movement, not digging in and fortifying. When the German troops went to a place, when they got to Denmark, when they got to the French coast, when they got to Belgium, Holland, they knew exactly where they were going to build their bunkers and position the defensive positions and where they were going to dig in. Because before the war, before the invasion, German tourists or soldiers in uh, civilian had done bicycle rides and painters and tari took artistic pictures all the way up and down the coasts posing as tourists made maps and maps and notes on where they would have to build these fortifications before they they even invaded that country so the germans had a very clear and specific plan on how and what and where they were going to build and what made this easier was they had over a hundred different type of standard designed bunkers. They wouldn't just slab up whatever. They were uniform. They knew exactly how much concrete, how much wood, how much reinforced, uh, how much rebar, uh, steel doors. They knew exactly how m much and what materials they needed for any given type of bunker. So when they go to, went to a place, said, well, we need a couple of Regelbau, a regular build, standard. Uh, we need a couple of Tobruks, we need a couple of these, a couple of these. They knew exactly how much concrete they would need, how much refor rebar, they knew exactly how much labor it would take and how long it would take to build. And that is uh, kind of the brilliance of how and why the Germans, with relatively few resources, especially at the tail end of the war, when they were really stretched, were still able to build and expand continuously because they knew exactly what to allocate. If you look at the uh, Danish, uh, the German forts in Denmark uh, that I documented, we ask, well, are the position, when was this position finished? None of the, the, the Atlantic Wall was never complete. None of the bunker uh, for, forts or fortifications or fighting positions were ever complete in that sense that uh, if the war had lasted 10 more years, they wouldn't build any more on there. What they did was each region, each commander, each section would be allocated X amount of building material every year. And they would, of course, build what was a priority list. First, they need to, we need to build housings for the big guns, for the cannons. We need to build machine gun bunkers. Uh, so that was what they would build in the first allocation of the first year of that occupation. Then the second year, well, then they would build reinforced housing for the troops, the trains, uh, and so on and so forth. So every year would be a progressive build because it was always an ongoing and evolving uh, 
construction. If you look at the Siegfried line, problem was initially the small bunkers they had built with the relatively small cannons. When those uh, had proven insufficient, well, all these cannons were pulled out and put to other use in the 39 and the 40s. Some of the steel doors were eventually repurposed and sent to the Atlantic Wall. But now there's a problem because you had to finish bunkers, but you couldn't put bigger cannons in there. So, because they're already uh, they're already finished construction, there was not enough room. Sort of like why you couldn't put a 76 millimeter in a Panzer one turret. There's just not enough room, and they have to build more bunkers that are bigger. But the basic construction outline of how you went about doing this is not really much different than from today. First, you dig a hole, then you build in a reinforced steel frame, and you surround it by wooden framework. Then you pour in a whole bunch of concrete and you let that dry for 24x hours. So then you mount the steel doors, all the ventilators, the heaters, uh, sleeping beds, embrasures, whatever you need after that. And of course, depending on how large a bunker it is, you've seen some of these enormous structures. You can't pour all that concrete in one day. And you need to get all these thousands and thousands of tons of cubic meters of concrete to the site, uh, which is again why it takes time to build some of these enormous structures and why it is very impressive to see some of these huge bunkers because of the logistics it took. We're still trying to figure out how they they built the pyramids logistically. Here is, is something that's almost akin to that when you look at the very 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 large structures. Uh, it was rather impressive uh, engineering feat to be quite honest especially when you look at underground facilities of hundreds of rooms uh, 40 meters down that's impressive now of course this was not an easy time when the Germans moved in and started redesignating areas as defensive positions for the for the civilians a lot of them had to be moved so when Germans designated uh, an era of, of limit or spare gebiet, then it was again up to the local authorities of that region, of that country, to inform those who unfortunately had to leave their house and home and go somewhere else. Uh, it wasn't Germans with rifles uh, driving you from your home at gunpoint. It was done within the local authorities, so people had time to pack up and go, and many of them would not return. Some of their houses had been torn down, uh, monument statues had been torn down, uh, forests had been cleared to, for fields of fire and construction of these defensive works. But again, pretty much all countries uh, did this. Uh, if, you, if you're in the way of, of, of a national threat, you, your, your house will have to relocate. Um, and that is pretty much exactly what, what happens. So practically how this worked, it was the German military engineers that was in charge of what kind of uh, fortifications they needed to build, where they wanted them put up, and it was the organization Tod that was responsible for building them. That was the practicality of it. If you had something like, for instance, in Denmark, it was uh, Festung Pioneerstab 31 that was in charge of planning and designing the constructions whereas it was the local branch of OT, Organization Toad, that was uh, hired to build it. And they in turn hired local contractors to do the practical work of building it. Interestingly enough, there were actually a lot of volunteers, Danish volunteers, French and so on volunteers, uh, that signed up to build these things because it was the only work there was to get at the time. It is not as straightforward as you would think when we look at uh, traditional thinking of, well, the Nazis had a bunch of slaves that would put them to work and they worked people to death and you would the camps and so on and so forth. And that's how it was all done. That's not how it was all done. Uh, specifically, you asked, uh, or the questions have been asked a lot of times on some one of my bunker videos from a couple of years ago in Denmark. Um, where the bunkers were not built by slave labor. 
there are parts of the Air Force uh, reinforced hangars built by the Germans that were constructed in sections in prefab. I think the Germans were the first who did prefab. And I don't know if you saw the video I did with the first airborne uh, landing history was in the, the German air, the Danish airfield of, of Alborg. Some of these reinforced prefab pieces were supposedly built and constructed in Poland by slave labor. I have not confirmed or denied, but the historian there that told me that that was the case. All these construction projects, like say you have in Denmark, you have Holland, they were put out to public bid, just like the, in Germany. Uh, if you had to build a tank or construct a new something, you put it out to public bid. This was not in that sense the, uh, I don't want to say this was not the dictatorship that it was, but it was. This was not a dictatorial operation in the sense where you just order this firm, you build that, you build that, the government took over all the firms. All the firms were still owned by civilians or by companies and all things that they need to be built, constructed, designed were pulled up, put up to, to public bid. Uh, so with the Taika tank, you had two competing firms working on that. Same thing with when the Germans marched into say Denmark or, or Holland they would put out, well we need to build this and they would put out bid for uh, local construction companies to come in and, and construct and build these and even German soldiers were conscripted to build and mobilize. There were about 12 million, 12 to 15 million forced laborers in Germany. Remember that term, we'll get back to it. The organization Tod was in charge of the building. Now, that's one number. So 20% of the German labor force at the time was estimated to be these forced or slave laborers. And there is a difference between forced labor, conscripted labor, and slave labor, although depending where they went and who they worked for, that difference becomes sometimes invisible, which makes the answer a little more, a uh, little harder to answer. But you're looking at 20% of the German workforce was about forced or slave laborers. And there's some 12 to 15 million of them throughout the entire war. To put that in context, uh, in Russia between 1930 and uh, 1953, there was about 18 million slave laborers. And you have to look at history through the prism of the time, like I keep telling you, of what was acceptable acceptable, and what was done. A lot of countries had their prisoners, their uh, unwanted even political prisoners, were put to work, put to use. Uh, building roads, building things, factories. There were forced laborers was not a specific symptom of World War II. It was something that had just been used. Organization Tod was in charge of German building projects. That came about from originally back in 1932-33 uh, Fritz Todt who ran the company, it was a civilian company, a construction company and they were one of many construction companies that was hired to build the German Autobahn, the freeways. They did really well with the building organization that eventually they grew and eventually was uh, taken over as a branch of the government and put in charge of all Reich labor. Until about 1939, everyone who worked for organization Tod were paid conscripted laborers, or mostly German workers. As the war progressed, that changed in, in different increments. Now, the way the organization Tod worked was, for instance, as I told you about the West Wall, they were building the West Wall was their first major military construction project, what they did was put out to bid uh, the work to German companies, local companies, uh, just like any government contract is put out today, uh, we need an offer, can you come build uh, XYZ in this location, how much is going to cost? And they would provide to some degree the laborers. 
you had the labor force um, that were the conscripted labor force in Germany up until the war where all men of the eligible age would be conscripted to six months of labor building roads building uh, whatever project had to be built for the for the country for six months which would in one hand also prepare them uh, for military service that was standard they were paid but they were conscripted so everybody had to serve in in the labor dienst and that conscription eventually of course went away as uh, the war started and there was more and more of a call for Germans to enter straight into the military and as the war turned poorly towards Germany there was a lack of workers as more and more Germans stayed in and went to the military and that's at that time the labor force became more and more filled with forced laborers, uh, conscripted laborers, foreign workers as the, uh, the ethnic Germans, if you will, uh, was sent to the front. That makes it uh, a little more complicated. What you then had after the invasion of Poland, you had uh, Polish soldiers that, that had uh, surrendered that were put to work as it was with everything in Germany, uh, there's a first a legal framework for what they were doing. And uh, from 1939-1940, the legal framework was set up for the organization to, to conscript uh, different categories of workers. You have forced laborers, uh, first forced workers, were uh, to be civilians from occupied territories that were conscripted or ordered to show up and paid a minimal wage and some of them were treated absolutely horrible and some of them were treated better depending on the territories from where they came and the occupational status of that country and the relation that country had with Germany and so forth. Then you had <clears throat> there's civilian workers that was conscripted. Then you have uh, Ostarbeiter or uh, workers from the east which were volunteered from the occupied territories and conscripted to work by Poles, Ukrainians, uh, Belarus, uh, all the occupied territories that the Germans had control over uh, they literally conscripted uh, those of a working age and sent them to Germany to work and to two-thirds of all the forced laborers in, uh, under German control were from the east and those from the east were generally treated a lot worse than if you say you had conscripted labors or forced labors from the western countries or Denmark, Norway, Holland, France and so on but there's an entire different story to that that I'll also get to. Then you also had volunteer prisoners of war or POWs that volunteered to work on project for the Germans. Now, under the Geneva Convention, you cannot force prisoners to do dangerous labor or work that uh, for, for your or the captors uh, military. Now, so that means that the, the, the British, the American POWs were generally treated a lot better by the Germans than their Russian or Polish or Eastern counterparts that were generally not treated very well and I'm putting it that mildly. There, there are several problems with what the Germans did. First of all, the war went really, really well for them. Probably better than the military had planned on and they took a lot more millions of Russian POWs than they um, had counted on. Which meant you had hundreds of thousands of Russian prisoners of war that were literally fenced in the field and not fed because they really hadn't planned for them so the logistics for feeding them or even the food was barely available and a lot of them starved to death. Um, so when the offer was made available that they could come uh, to, uh, to Germany or be sent to France or to be sent to Western Europe to build fortifications or to work for the German government, a lot of them volunteered. And as I said, that's not really much of a 
what are you going to do? You are going to starve to death with the hundreds of thousands of your friends in this field or you volunteer to go work for your enemy with a chance of you surviving. So they did that. And the Russian POWs especially, they already knew that they were in trouble because Stalin had issued an order that they were not welcome back and they were to be seen as traitors. So by being a Russian POW, you were already a traitor and a lot of the ones who returned back to Russia after the war were sent on, just passed on to the gulags because they surrendered so they must be traitors. So being a Russian soldier during World War II was really not a good experience. Um, you, you're doomed if you didn't, doomed if you didn't. So a lot of them, they volunteered to go to, uh, to Europe and work. Uh, again, they were treated a lot harder. Um, how, what percentage of those who survived or died of starvation or was worked to death as opposed to those who were military prisoners of war? I can't find the numbers, so I don't know. But then you also have straight out civilian volunteers. And remember, only 20% were actually uh, forced laborers. So everybody else were, were volunteers. Or they were put out to bid and they were conscripted or, or signed up. Or you had all these in all these different companies or all these different countries that the organization told went out. What they did whenever they get to a place like, like Denmark or France, they would put out their building projects to bid of the companies that were in that area. Then that company would put up a contract, they would get the contract, and the Uber and the tour would supply laborers to work for that company. So it became a little bit of intermingled. So you could have a construction project in Holland where you had Russian slave labor, if you will, you had volunteer uh, Frenchmen who worked and was paid. You had Dutch, Dutch companies that were paid. You had German soldiers that had to come help work if they couldn't find the labor any other way. So you could find a lot of different categories of workers on any given construction site. And they're all kept apart. But a lot of labor camps sprung up all over Europe to house all these different entities. What I specifically talked about was uh, the way it worked in Denmark. And I'll get back to that because that is a slightly different story than in others. There was a million French workers that volunteered to work on building German projects. Then you had in Holland, who had surrendered, you had military prisoners that had been taken by the Germans in uh, 1940 during the invasion, who had been released. But in 1943, a lot of things started happening in the occupied territories 42, 43, things started going south for the Germans on the front, and that led to them having to start conscripting and finding more and more labor, uh, volunteer or forced, or outright uh, taking them out from the concentration camps. An interesting thing that happened it was some 10,000 uh, Dutch soldiers were sent summonses to appear uh, at the time and place at a uh, German camp, where they would be sent on to Germany for, for labor. I'm, I'm not entirely sure if they were told why, but they had to appear or else their families would be made to suffer or maybe their families, their fathers, their, uh, would be picked up instead. So they did. And after the war, they were treated absolutely horrendously. When they returned to Holland, they were seen as traitors, uh, despite the fact that they had no choice. Uh, when the German authorities said, you show up, you show up, they could have gone into hiding. How in the small country, how is 10,000 people going to hide? And if they know where their families live, they, not everybody can hide. Um, it took some 30, 40 years before these Dutch soldiers were given their, their pension, their pay. They, they, they were awarded a medal for having been prisoners of war that they had to pay for. It's very shameful uh, the way they were treated. Uh, but there was a lot of strange things we look back on and go, like, why did they do that? But at the time, it must have made sense. A lot of misconceptions as well. So, to finish this, you had the Dutch that were generally 
seen in a fairly favorable light uh, by the uh, by the Germans. There was a Dutch SS battalion. There was a lot of French that volunteered for the SS. A lot of the Scandinavian countries had members that served for the SS, predominantly because they wanted to fight the, what they perceived as a threat as the as the Russians, the communists. Um, so. On one hand, you had forced labor from a country that also provided soldiers for the Reich, which was a little confusing. And if you follow these 10,000 Dutch soldiers uh, as, as they were sent to labor camps in Germany and worked under generally miserable, horrible conditions, that if you look at it, I find it hard to not look at that as anything other than slave labor, and they were fed too little, they were treated crappy, they were uh, sometimes beaten, and they had a miserable time of the work they had to do. But depending on what German company or person or guard supervised them, they had uh, the horrible ones to the ones that took them out behind the bars and gave them a beer. What I have found is all the different stories from forced laborers, slave laborers, uh, volunteer workers during World War II for the Germans were completely different experiences for everyone. Where you had the Polish or the Ukrainian or the Czechoslovakian the girls and, and the young boys that were sent to farms in Germany where they lived alongside everyone else working on the harvest, helping on the farms because again all the young men had been sent to the front so somebody had to help do the farm work. Germany in general was, did not have a very industrialized um, uh, harvest. Uh, they, they, did, they had a lot of manual labor in the field. It was not as, as mechanized as you would think a farming society could be or probably should be given how much mechanization and modernization the Germans had at the time. So you had those that lived side by side with German families and protected them after the war because they had been there and stood up for them as that they had not been abused, they had been treated well, all the way to the ones that were worked to death in horrible conditions. Uh, in, d in different camps, in different ways, by different people. So it's very hard to say, yes, you had volunteer laborers, you had POWs that worked, some of them worked in, in decent conditions, and some of them never returned. Um, which, like I said, there's as many stories uh, and different faiths uh, for these people that, that, that almost are people. Now, to take away from what most of you have always heard and believed is so is the SS construction sites because the SS or part of the SS uh, and I'm not part of the SS were almost were run as a as a corporation as a for-profit business uh, and you now you're looking at the horrible uh, slave labor conditions of the the Dora Dora uh, building of the, the stone quarries of the heavy manual labor because the SS and sometimes under the general government all these different Eastern European countries ran the, the, the labor camps, the concentration camps, the slave labor camps. And again you have concentration camps, you have slave labor camps, you have different categories of prisoners and why they were there. Some were there because they were Jews that the Germans did not want within German border and sent on to the east where they ended up in ghettos and camps and were under the control of the SS then that put them to work in quarries and of course again like everything else in Germany was run as, as it, uh, put out to bid so when the SS said well we can provide you um, gravel or, or stones for this construction project to OT they could have all these quarries mined by slave labor they didn't have to pay and that way they could sell all the with the products to the OT or to other parts of civilian companies that had other contracts with the German company government for less and make more of a profit which is a very sick way of, of doing it but that's how you had a lot of slave laborers that would work to death under the SS and you've all seen those horrible stories and the tunnels and the underground a lot of things that took, pla took place 
the further east you got when you're in Germany, you're in, in Czechoslovakia, you're in, uh, in the, the closer you get to the east, the worse the treatment generally became. Generalizing, because it again is not really that simple. Like I said, you had a million Frenchmen that signed up to volunteer to work on German projects. You have hundreds of thousands of Frenchmen that signed up to, to fight for the SS. Again, you had a difference between the Waffen-SS, which was the fighting SS, um, and you had the uh, death set that ran the camps, the Allgemeinde. You also had the SS intelligence service. So there's a lot of different... So not everybody did everything, and not everybody was involved in everything, but they were certainly uh, associated with an organization that did. And then you look at the different camps and the different prisoners in them, as in why were they there and who were the people in these camps. Some of them were Jews that had not managed to get away or come under the control of, uh, of the German or the general government as they uh, invaded Eastwoods. Uh, some of them were French Jews, Dutch Jews uh, that were rounded up and sent to these concentration camps or slave labor camps. Um, they were uh, outright criminals that had committed crimes and had been arrested and sent to various camps depending on what crime they had committed. Um, you had SS men that had committed crimes that were sent to camps. You had political prisoners. Uh, most of the communists had been in one way or another rounded up in Germany and, and sent to camps of again various degrees. Uh, gypsies uh, were sent to the camps. There were a lot of Russian prison, uh, prisoners of war sent to the camps. And, uh, as my understanding is, you have uh, a lot of the camp system was set up specifically to provide labor for large-scale businesses or, or construction or industry, uh, such as uh, I.B. Farben's plant in Via Canal. And again, uh, the SS Works projects and they were the ones in charge of the camp. At times, some of these would be lent to organizations like the tool or sent to them as, as uh, laborers. I'm not going to talk that much about the, the, the SS laborers and slave laborers because we're talking about who built bunkers. And the SS really didn't have anything to do with that. They built some of the underground uh, sites, the the, the rocket sites, and you got to remember the V2, the, the V1, V2 project was eventually taken over by the SS as a as a weapons program. But the bunkers facing uh, protecting the German borders, uh, the West Wall, the East Wall, the Atlantic Wall, uh, the Siegfried Line, um, came rain <laughs> earthworm. They were built uh, by the OT, and again. That was a different conditions how they were built. So now we talk about Denmark, and when I put up that video, where we have been, there's been a lot of back and forth on on the text under the uh, the video, some from Hensholm um, and Banksbo, I think, of who built them. And I can tell you, they were not built by slave laborers, because in Denmark, very soon after uh, the, the German army moved in. Uh, the Germans fought for the first day, no, I'm sorry, the Danes fought for the first day and then they were an occupied country. The government, the Danish army and the government had very little, uh, none, no chance of standing up to the German army and they surrendered uh, to save lives. Now in Denmark the experience was a lot different. When the Germans invaded uh, the Danish government knew they had no chance of standing up against a German war machine, and the German army, the Danish army, fought bravely for the first for the for the first part of the day, and then it was clear German paratroopers landed in Alborg, uh, the Danes scuttled their fleet, and the Germans poured in over the border and were literally faced by uh, Danish soldiers with a few cannons on bicycles with their rifles. Not a fair fight. Everybody knew it. The Danes surrendered, but were allowed the autonomy of keeping their own government. They were not occupied in the sense that the Germans put in somebody, a proxy government. 
the Danes were allowed to exist. And one of the prices they paid were, well, the Germans are, they, they run, they own the country, but we run it. So we're going to run it in a, in a sense that they're going to collaborate with the Germans. F again, for the safe of safety of the of the country, because what choice do you really have? You're back to the, the plight of the Russian POW sitting on a field. If you're in Denmark and you are occupied by overwhelming force, who says, "Well, I want you to, uh, I want you to do this, this, and this," what are you going to do? You're going to say no, and endure the wrath of well. Next, you have the Gestapo coming in and start rounding up everybody and. People get shot against the wall, and instead of having that happen, the Danish government chose to to collaborate, although it had a very active resistance. And in 1943, the Danish government finally resigned, ceasing corporation, uh, active corporation with with the German occupying force. But initially, what happened was, as I said, the Germans knew exactly where they wanted to go and where they wanted to build, and they went to the building sites and put out to bid for Danish companies to construct all these bunkers and all these fortifications to the German specifications, of course, with OT oversight. Interestingly enough, uh, the Danish government actually had to pay for this. The German soldiers in Denmark did not see themselves as an occupying force, which is important to remember. Even the soldier book said uh, they are there to protect Denmark from invasion of the Allies. Same thing in Norway. The German troops up there did not believe they were there to occupy Norway, but to protect the Norwegians from the British and from the Allied invasion, which was, well, in all honesty, not entirely wrong, considering that Churchill and the British were planning to invade Norway and occupy Norway and occupy the iron ore mines and march into Sweden and occupy or destroy the Swedish mines. The British were just as well at the same time planning to occupy two neutral countries. The Germans literally beat them to it by a few days. So that was what the German soldiers believed. They didn't see themselves as invaders as they did in Poland. They saw themselves as here to protect and were, uh, the, the Danes from harm. And. I will say the military rules that governed the German soldiers in Denmark were incredibly strict. There were very few uh, problems, uh, rapes, assaults, uh, theft uh, going on uh, in Denmark. And if it was ever discovered, there's an instance where one German soldier, he stole a, a piece of leather and uh, his friend was aware and they were both arrested and shipped off. People, German soldiers were literally shot for doing something like that. So there's a strict discipline as in how the German soldiers were to behave. Um, one can say, well, they tried and they, uh, one would say they, they, they somewhat succeeded from what I hear from the elderly of that generation that I spoke with. Of course, it was a scary time for Denmark as the German soldiers marched in and took up positions on the coasts. But then they hired Danish companies to build the bunkers with Danish laborers and the Danish government was made to pay for it and to feed the German soldiers because, well, the German soldiers, ostentatiously, was there to protect the Danes so they could pay protection money, if you will. Now. A lot of Danes volunteered initially the first couple of years to work for the Germans because the Germans paid better than the wages they had. And again, there was very little work to get. In fact, it, it, they literally left, some would leave their job to go work on the bunker construction because it paid better. And then, of course, in those towns and cities where they had to be housed, they had to rent rooms or, or places to live. And the people who owned those houses that rented the rooms, they were up the price because they knew they were getting paid more. And it became a business. After the war, a lot of these companies had to account for why they worked for the Germans. But of course, the government had sanctioned it and told them to. And there was not that much of a legal reprisals after. 
Uh, however, after the Danish government resigned in 1943, things became a little different. And shall we say, a little more scrupulous in the sense that before there was a little bit more check and balances as to how big the bills were. If I was a Danish company, I built a bunker and I sent them a 700 Eichmark bill and I, well, well you know what, actually uh, I had a couple of little overtime, so here's an 800 Eichmark bill. You know, after after 43, the bills kind of grew and there was less oversight on the German behalf as to how much the bills were. They really didn't care uh, in that sense and, and there was more, it was more frowned upon to work for the Germans at that time, but it still certainly uh, continued. And unfortunately, again, there the local population had to be, uh, had to move. And this was put out again to the local authorities that you have to clear this, uh, this village, because we have to build bunker fortifications, we have to dig in landmines, put up barbed wire, it is not safe. They wanted the civilian population out of the area because it wouldn't be safe. And the civilian safety had by, been ordered to be under the German authorities. So they can't have civilians run around test firing weapons, they had minefields, where they might get hurt for the civilians' own safety. And they were compensated for leaving. They were paid, they were paid more if they left. The, the faster they left, the more they were paid. And they were paid for the loss of house. The other housing was temporary housing, at least were put up for those who couldn't find, uh, who couldn't find a place to live right off. But they were compensated for this, and after the war, some of them moved back, and some of them never did. Like the fishermen up in here, stayed in here, cells, a lot of them did. Um, and interestingly enough, they, the 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 tort organization, who worked clearly, of course, with the, the military intelligence as to secrecy of the fortifi fortifications and their layout and the design, minefields, so on and so forth. They hired a Danish architect to help them make some of the bunkers look like they would blend in with, um, with the surrounding buildings, with, 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 with nature, with what was already there. Of course, for camouflage purposes, for allied surveillance, they make bunkers look like summer houses or small fishermen's village houses um, very successfully. But also there was a care taken by the German occupying force to not build and construct something that would be completely unsightly and out of the way. Um, one could say, of course, this three-story enormous bunker that they built out at uh, one of the airfields, three stories, uh, used more concrete than the uh, one of the entire bridges out there. Uh, couldn't move it, can't move it, still there today little unsightly, but it's not going anywhere, and it's still used by the Air Force today. Some of the small ones were laid out and designed so they would sort of blend in, and uh, most of them, a lot of them are still there today, a lot of them are still falling into the ocean. But that's the Danish situation that was a little different. Um, again, in the Western occupied territories, uh, the contracts were laid out to bid, and the ranks were then filled with different types of workers. Some were slave laborers, some were forced workers, some were conscripted labor, some were volunteered, and some were just outright paid and hired. Uh, hired. And, and that is pretty much who built them. Uh, Denmark were not built by slave labor. The others, it's a little bit more murky as to, you would almost look at each fortification and say, well, you'd have to go and say, who built this one? is not necessarily, this one may be built by uh, a German work team, the one next to it might have been built by uh, slave labor. That's why I usually never uh, gone into this because, well, it, it's, a, it's a part of history that needs to be remembered and I, I suppose if for those who restore bunkers and put up museums, it would be an interesting plaque to note who built this specific bunker or that specific bunker. Uh, for those of us who visit them and travel the coastlines and look at the fortifications, it's almost impossible to know who built this specific one and who didn't. Were they paid? Were they fed that day? Did they, uh, did they die? Um, or were they 
were just workers that were that volunteered and got paid. It's very hard to say on an individual bunker basis because there were these all these different fractions that were sent out to uh, to the organization to who ran this. But it's interesting to note that only 20% of the workforce were slave labor. Meaning that a lot of these constructions could not have been built by slave labor. Uh, which I, I would see that as a positive thing. Uh, if all of them had been built uh, by slave labor, that uh, many of whom had perished, that certainly would I don't even know how to put words on that. Um, so I, I, I'm a little. The lining of the cloud is, I think, it's it's a nicer to think that eighty percent of them were not built by slave laborers, and we can look at them for their construction, for the design, for the enormous effort it took to build them. And we can focus on the history behind them. Um, it's hard to look at some of these enormous fortifications and not think about the logistics of how on earth did they build these things, which is predominantly what I've been trying to do. But of course, you asked who built them. And then the, the, this is the best answer I come up with a little bit of everybody. Um, there's also a quarter million guest workers some from Turkey, uh, the Middle East. Uh, I have seen uh, black people work on these projects. There's a picture right there um, of this, which is inter an interesting concept in that time and era under that, that management leadership. But there were, again, uh, volunteers from many other countries that came to work on these things. They were paid less than the German worker, certainly but they were paid more than they would have been at home. So again, there's another uh, layer of people who came to work, the, the foreign uh, volunteer workers. For the TOAD organization, things again changed in 1942-45, where uh, in, you had about one and a quarter, one and a half million uh, foreign workers that worked for the TOAD organization. And remember, in I think 1942, Fritz told he died in a, in a plane crash, and the organization was taken over by uh, uh, Alfred Speer. And interestingly enough, when you look at some of the notes on who was working on these fortifications, because it was such hard work and grueling and cold and wet, and sometimes, especially in building in the winter, terrible. Um, some of the laborers just got tired of it and went home. I think it's interesting that you you sign up to build a military contract for or a, or or bunker for the for the German military and you get fed up with it and said hell with it I'm quitting I'm going home. That that was an option I thought was uh, was interesting and obviously not an option for everybody. Where to build the bunkers was all determined from a strategical tactical vantage point. And like I said, they had a good idea where they were going to go and how they're going to go there. Now, you had a quite a bit of rivalry between the German three branches of the Army, Air Force, Navy, because everybody wanted something different or slightly different. And there was a lot of red tape uh, within the German system. And that was created a, a lot of problems, a lot of different commands, a lot of infighting. Uh, bureaucracy really did get in the way of a lot of things the Germans were trying to do or achieve or build or create or design at the time. Uh, somewhere somebody should probably have tried to cut that for, for, the, for, for their war effort. And we all know that uh, the, the Navy, Army, Air Force, they, they all had their own individual ideas and agendas. And it, it seemed they did not always, on the higher level, cooperate in the way they did at lower ranks. Um, also, when you build fortifications on the coastlines of, of Scandinavia, of Europe, if you look at Denmark, uh, 
the coastline is constantly being eroded by the sea and you have to uh, account for that and if you did not which some did you find bunkers that are incomplete because they had to be abandoned because literally the ocean would erode them before they were even done and they would have to build new ones further back <clears throat> there's a lot of interesting things that had sunk into the sea and the beaches uh, all over Europe indeed most of the bunkers you see today are only a fraction of what was actually built some have been destroyed and removed uh, and a lot of them have literally just been covered up or sunk into the sand uh, and some are still found today some not many years ago a completely unmolested and undamaged uh, bunker with all personal effects were found on one of the uh, Danish beaches uh, all intact inside it had simply just disappeared and been forgotten and as a historian I l love to to hear and see what we can find and what appears and what is found on the underground from from time to time and I think we should keep looking because there's a lot more stuff hidden beneath the surface than uh, than we're aware of Now it is interesting, again I mentioned the German doctrine of war was about movement and getting out there and moving forward and mechanization to a degree. Of course the German bunker construction was somewhat inspired by the Maginot Line. However, Hitler was very adamant that this was going to be a position where the troops could find shelter from uh, air raids and artillery but not a position where they would be complacent and want to just hide and not fight. So the German High Command were looking for something a little more flexible, something that could be uh, protection, but not in, in the underground comfortable way. It would still be, uh, be a fighting position meant and thought of as a temporary stopover before further movement. Back to the logistics. When you build a Regelbau bunker, and while the construction was underway, initially a meeting would be held between the military branch that ordered the construction, like the army, and the OT. This meeting, a building site, would be discussed, taken into consideration the pros and cons, and there were considerations made to existing private property and history, uh, terrain, and as these plans were made. So they did not, if they could avoid it at all, roll over historical monuments, history, or, or the local farmhouse. I think there's an interesting note. Where this could not be avoided, uh, farmers got to go. You had most of the common bunkers in the Atlantic Wall was called uh, the B strength, Baustarke B, uh, which was about two meters thick reinforced concrete walls, roof, were capable of withstanding about a direct hit from about a 500 kilogram uh, airborne bomb or about 200 millimeter artillery shell straight on. But these things were built to, to withstand bombs and yeah, shells yeah, and... Yeah. The walls are three meters thick and also the roof, it's, um, it's thicker than normal. The normal size of uh, a World War II bunker is two meters, but here on, uh, in Belgrade, it's uh, three meters. Because they couldn't get it underground, the, the soil is too moist, so they built them on the ground. All personnel and operational bunkers had their own heating and ventilation system. They had telephones, radio communication, and they were gas-proof. Uh, with the entrances were all covered by machine gun embrasures. Bunkers were definitely uniform. They had a plan and they carried it out and they, they did not deviate. Although some places where they partially built into um, mountains, such as Norway and, and parts of France, where you had to improvise a little bit and they tunneled into these existing mountains and built smaller bunkers around the entrances or where the the weaponry would stick out. Fascinating excavations that I've seen. I know History Hunter has been digging through a lot of those here on YouTube. You should check out his videos. He did a great job on that. Building an R622 bunker, which is one of the predominant crew protection bunkers that you see around the Atlantic Wall. First, of course, you can do the paperwork because German army and military does not run without their paperwork. Um, did I mention to the uh, detriment of any commanding officer I've ever had, I hate doing paperwork. 
first you had to remove sand, soil, um, whatever was in the way of a building as a crew bunker and it had to be built so it would blend in with the landscape and it would be able to be camouflaged uh, later on and not be able to be seen which is why a lot of these are still actually hidden and easy to hide because they even put on grass on top of them so they were really hard to see from the air. You would move for this type of bunker, the R622, about five, six hundred cubic meters of uh, material was removed and this had to be done by hand shovels, wheelbarrows, hard labor, digging in the ground. Uh, there were excavators used if these were available, which were certainly by all means not everywhere. Uh, the work days, typical 10-14 hours, seven days a week. Um, We'll extra sleep on Sunday for the workers. Some of these bunkers were also built right on the ground, not dug into it, depending on if it was rocky, hard, or the high groundwater. So that's why you see some of these just sitting on the, on the ground. Uh, the steel reinforcement was 25 by 25 centimeter mesh, about 12, 12 millimeter round steel bar, rebar, shape tied together with wire. The reinforced mesh, it would reinforce brittle concrete and make it far more resistant of uh, impact so it wouldn't shatter. And it was not always the best concrete you had to use, especially later on the war, as materials became more and more scarce. I-profile steel bars connected with 20 centimeter wide, 2-3 millimeter steel thick plates was formed on the ceiling. Uh, before casting drain pipes, uh, conduits for electrical installations, air conduits, radio antenna, chimneys would be fitted. Uh, chimneys would be fitted with a deflector for hand grenades and dem or demolition charges. So you can just throw, like you see in some of the movies, you can't just throw in a hand grenade because it will literally slide out and not actually enter the, uh, the bunker. A lot of the bunkers, they had a periscope fitted, which is a high ticket item if you find one. I have a lot of friends in museums that really, really would like to get a periscope because they're just so hard to find. So if you have a original World War II German bunker periscope sitting in your basement, it is important to pour the entire bunker in one go. Pausing and restarting would or could weaken as a result. And the pouring of concrete literally had to go on around the clock or for days on end and if it was a, a large bunker. Um, the approach for the bunkers had to be good. This approach kind of worked and it was possible to keep pouring and keep maintaining for bunkers up to about a thousand uh, cubic meters of concrete. Larger constructions had to be done in sections like I mentioned before because concrete, heat, hardening, all these aspects there are to building something like this. Um, it was important that the concrete didn't uh, get time to settle and didn't split and I'm not an engineer but I know that much. Plus in order to to facilitate that you can continuously pour concrete until the small bunker was done you had to have the scaffolding uh, ready and in place so you could always continue pouring that did not have um, all the, the, the ways of doing that that we have uh, today. And the Germans used a high quality mixture of, of sand, gravel, three, four hundred kilograms of cement per metric ton of concrete and imported aggregates as well. Uh, for instance, the local gravel in Jutland and Denmark tend to be too round uh, or contain too much flint in order to, uh, to really work well in, in, uh, in bunkers. So you can't just pour whatever into it. You'll see some bunkers, they display like patterns, little, little holes in them that kind of could be interpreted as, as air pockets that developed uh, during the pouring or ladder damage, uh, erosion of the surface. Actually what they are is part of the camouflage that was, uh, it was achieved by nailing crumpled cement paper bags uh, onto the sides of the outer, outer shuttering just because if it was completely smooth, the surface would stick out um, from the background. It would be easier to detect. You also see that on the outside of the concrete, you had to pour uh, asphalt so that moisture could get into the cement. That's why if you see the original bunkers and you get them really, they're, they're black. Uh, and then, of course, camouflage would be applied to that as well. But you had a, 
black layer of, of, of tar or asphalt on, on the outside of them. After the bunker was done, the military engineers would take over after the, the case, the shell was done. Um, then they would install the door frames, the embrasures, the stoves, all that stuff, and of course uh, the weaponry. But the German bunkers, they, they were, you know, it's impressive. You had, you had heat, you had air condition, you had air flowing. They would put uh, wood, uh, wood on the walls and ceilings to insulate them further, both for sound, because if you're in a command center and you're sitting in a naked concrete bunker, the sound reverberates and it's hard to hear radios and it's just really noisy. So they would line all the walls and ceilings with wood, uh, because rubber would have been ideal, but not really wasn't available, especially not towards the end of the war. The fitting, the outfitting of any given bunker with the steel doors and the weaponry and radios and heaters and, and electrics, all the stuff uh, that would make the bunker useful or ready to, to be functional, that actually usually took longer than building the entire outer shell. So construction, camouflage, fitting, and then it was handed over to whoever ordered it, whether it was the German, the, the army, the marine, or... Here they had their communication, uh, wireless and also telephones with the wires, so you can couple up to, uh, ex ex for example, Germany or other bunkers here in Denmark. But here, uh, because of all the electronics uh, that was in this room, they had to have some um, uh, special Insulation? Yeah, or what you call it, uh, floor. Uh, it was made of uh, asphalt and uh, rubber because there was so uh, the static electricity was so heavy that the the German soldiers uh, get headaches and stuff. And if you look at today's building standards and norms and all the labor laws, it would be almost impossible to build some of these things today like the R622 uh, crew bunker in Denmark a surveyor did a study that with today's uh, in today's money it would cost almost 400,000 euros to build one of these things which roughly I guess like 480,000 um, dollars you're looking at a very quick turnaround maybe three to five weeks from beginning to delivery of many of these uh, medium-sized bunkers and certainly the small two-man to brook machine gun uh, positions would only take 11 to 15 cubic meters of concrete they were quick and fast and easy to build and you saw them everywhere uh, also you would see armored turrets that was built onto bunkers uh, or armored domes that was put onto an underground uh, underground bunker um, you would see tanks without engines that had roll, been rolled into an embrasure where it was covered from straight on attack and they would fight from the regular turret. You see those tank turrets uh, that were built and put in positions all over uh, the World War II map. Uh, Russians did it, the French did it, we did it, the British did it, uh, which is interesting. You see the especially smaller turrets of obsolete tanks had been taken off and, and put on these uh, beach locations. The first tank in World War II the Germans had, the actual tank was a Panzer I. Very small two-man machine guns. This is the turret. See how small this actually is. And what they did, they became obsolete quite quickly in the, in the war. You need to upgrade to bigger tanks, better armor, bigger guns. Uh, that the Panzer I chassis and Turret just couldn't cope with. So they took these off and they planted them in encasements here in Normandy, all around the occupied territories where they needed to defend. They buried down just the turrets, pencil one, two, threes. It's easy to build a small Tobruk two man bunker and then put the turret of a Panzer one or two on top of it. So by that time, uh, the Panzer 1 and 2 had been obsolete by some time, so you're sitting with turrets with machine guns in them or smaller cannons that you could stick on there, which would be perfectly uh, well designed against personnel, uh, landing crafts, invasion forces initially without heavy tanks.
This is where the ammunition train would come in. So let's go have a look. So the Germans spent an enormous amount of resources building these bunkers uh, all over Europe. And the question then arises, was it worth it for them to do so? With the resources they used to build an Atlantic wall that was breached practically in a day. And I cover that extensively in a Q&A a couple of weeks ago, months ago. And I, well, I answer that at length, but uh, I have found uh, an answer to be absolutely yes and absolutely no. I guess you're going to have to go to that episode to figure out what I mean by that. Ha! Huh. A lot of you have written me about uh, fortifications up in Norway that I'm dying to come up and see as soon as people are done coughing and I can actually get there. And um, sorry, this was a, a one note uh, episode of Q&A. It's been a very, very long couple of weeks and I did not really have time to go over a lot of different questions. I apologize, uh, been on duty. Uh, then one episode, special episode more I am working on is the doctrine difference between the German and the French military leading up to uh, the invasion of uh, Battle of France and how and why the Germans worked and what doctrine ideas they developed after World War I and how the French developed and how they worked out of World War I and how they came up with two completely different mindsets that individually worked, just not fighting each other. So there's going to be an in-depth on the German military structure, doctrine, tactics, and what went wrong and how uh, it went wrong for the French, which was basically boiling down to lack of communication. But I will do a in-depth, and for those of you who are in the military today and teaching in the academies, hopefully that will be something you can use um, uh, that I will be putting together hopefully in the next week or two. And then I will get back to regular questions that you are all asking that I'm so happy that you are. And after this week of creationess, uh, I will tell you one thing about the deployment this past week. You guys know I don't take questions on current day politics. Uh, that's not what we're here for. Uh, I will absolutely speculate on anything historic and I'll talk about uh, anything of any of the wars. Uh, but from what I just saw in the deployment we occurred here over the past uh, week plus in America and especially here in California, I will give praise to uh, the military command of uh, the National Guard, of the State Guard, uh, the LAPD, the Sheriff's Department, uh, Beverly Hills PD, Long Beach PD. Uh, there was a great bunch of dedicated men and women that I got to work with and I was my honor to serve with every single one of you guys. And shout out to the 79th, 153rd, uh, 100th, uh, 40th ID that I served with. Um, it was a pleasure. And I will tell you all that I have seen some incredibly dedicated, hard-working soldiers and members of law enforcement that truly care about the communities, about the cities, about doing their duties. And you should all be very proud of these young men and women. And I will give a thumbs up to the command leadership of all organizations for having planned and prepped and pulled this thing together logistically this was an enormous task that had never been seen before. Uh, thumbs up to um, to General Kogan, um, General Yeager, um, General Baldwin, absolutely to the Chief of LAPD, uh, to the Chief of the LAPD Task Force, uh, Panetta. Great, great, great job and there will be a lot of post conversation on how well this operation was carried out and how well the logistics worked and how well we all worked together. And I hope that that corporation uh, was reflected and will be reflected in the community. And I will say to the community of, of LA and uh, Long Beach and Beverly Hills, I can only talk to where I was, the public support for seeing your soldiers 
in uniform was absolutely heartbreaking. It was just so wonderful um, to stand post. It, it is just stressful and horrifying to think that you have to stand post within our own country, within our own community. But to then see every car that goes by is waving every 10 minutes. One of you guys in the community, one of you civilians, pull up a car with, here's 10 pizzas, thank you for being here. Here's some Gatorade, thank you for being here. Um, the thanks and gratitude on behalf of the communities were really, really, it was just wonderful. It, it was so heartwarming, it was. Uh, and I want to thank you all for the support. And um, I hope all of us can get along and get some more sleep and uh, figure it out. Because, uh, but if this is any indication of how well the community and uh, us in uniform can work together, might be hope for all of us. And on that note, I'm going to go back to sleep. <laughs> and send me your questions. And I'm sure there's something I forgot to tell you, but that's what we have next week for.